In honor of the 70th anniversary, uh, I thought as a worship service and as song service, what better way to honor the 70 years of the singing Church of God than to have kind of a stroll down memory lane music-wise. Well, some that morning we shall see Jesus in the air. He's coming after you and me. Joys are to share. Oh, what rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise. Head toward that jubilee yonder in the sky. Oh, what singing. Oh, what shouting. Shouting on that happy morning when we all shall die. All the heavenly hosts, we began to sing just like now. Sing in the Holy Ghost, out of heaven we read. The millions there will join the song, and with it we shall be. Praise the Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. Oh, what singing, singing, oh, what shouting, shouting on that happy morning when we all shout. shout out. We, need, we do need some old Pentecostal. Somebody shout, run a aisle. Well, Brother White used to run at camp meeting. I, I got brought me into the Church of God, him I'm running with a chair. Today, House would be full. Brother White would run. He'd take his chair with him so he'd have a place to sit when he come back. One of these days I'm going home Where no sorrows ever come We'll soon be done with troubles and trials Save from heartache, pain and care We shall all the glory share I'm going to sit down beside my Jesus Yes, I'm going to sit down and rest a little while We'll soon be done with troubles and trials It is a real delight and an honor for us to be here. Um, I've had a lot of uh, flashbacks as we're sitting here. Some of those songs, I remember being a little kid sitting on the platform. See, I sat on the platform with my dad. We were three years, I was three years old when we moved here and, and uh, that little picture you saw up there with me in a suit, that, that was me, that was the way I looked. That's the way my mother dressed me. And I'd sit on the platform with Dad. Pastor sat on the platform then. I'd sit up there, and he told me, he said, now, now, if you ever fall over and go to sleep, you can't sit up here anymore. <laughs> so I never fell over and went to sleep. I sat straight up and went to sleep. <laughs> I was afraid to move. Many, many, many good memories. Uh, never forget one revival. Or the Kobe may have been there when uh, building the, the building on uh, that they showed that he built was was packed to the walls. I mean, it was just it was just vibrating with 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 glory, you know. And uh, the the side there was a side door over here, and a police officer came and flashed a light in Dad's face. He was on the platform. The evangelist was preaching, and, and the officer flashed a light in his face. Well, that never was real smart to do that to him. 
You know, he's only 24, 25 years old and had a fuse just about that long. And uh, so he went over there and the, and the police officer told him, he said, the chief sent me down here to tell you to either shut this thing down, calm it down, or we're going to come and padlock the doors. Dad looked at him and said, well, you go back and tell the chief the day he padlocks these doors, he'll be using old glory for a dish rag. <laughs> And the revival went on, and it didn't get any quieter. I can promise you that. A lot of wonderful, wonderful things. I did. I came to the Lord as, as, a, as a child in children's church, five years old. And it stuck. Now, have I been perfect? Absolutely not. Don't ever let anybody convince you that you can be. You, you, you know, we're, we're flesh and blood. In fact, the writer of the, Psalm, the Psalmist David said, God knows we're just breath. He understands that. But from that day till this, it's been my desire to live for the Lord and to serve Him. And uh, started, I started school in Porterville. I, I'd, I'd love it if Danny Moore were here because he, I'd tell everybody he took me to school. He was so much older than me and everything. <laughs> but uh, the Lord has been good through all the years. I talked to Dad last week. He's 87 years old. He has uh, suffered a, a fractured hip and is in uh, therapy to get that re re recuperated and uh, he's not moving as quick as he used to but uh, he said to be sure and, and send his love and his greetings because he has a lot of fond memories and great memories of ministry here in Porterville in the San Joaquin Valley and uh, if it had been any way possible I promise you he'd have been here but uh, that just wasn't possible. Uh, physically, and so uh, remember him when you pray. We appreciate it so very much. I'd love to spend a lot of time just reminiscing, but uh, my my job is to preach, and I just tell you this: I don't preach near as long if you act like you like it. So the length of this may be determined by how you react to it. But uh, I, it's it's always a great delight to be with you and to be with with Pastor David and his family, and uh, I've been hearing about David White for so many years when he was a sports writer and then a uh, youth pastor and associate and, and what all he did. And then, then when I heard he came here, I said, you know, that's an exciting, that's an exciting transition to, to come and to, and to see what God's doing and the things that, that the Lord's blessing. And it's just uh, thank you, Pastor, for this honor, for this opportunity. And and uh, Jeff's told you about everything you need to know about him and him and us. We had a great relationship, and he, he's just—he's been one of those special young men that has grown into a not so young man now. That uh, that God has favored in so many ways, and uh, I, I've always appreciated his honesty, his sincerity, his sensitivity to the leadership of the Spirit of God, and his commitment to the cause of the gospel. And I appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, look with me tonight to Acts chapter 3. Jeff said, I preached for a year on the book of Joshua, and I, and I did. I started in Joshua, the first chapter, and preached straight through the book. It took me over a year to do that. After that, Brother Jeff, when you left, I started on the book of Acts. We were building a new church building, and I thought it would be a good thing to do to remind folks what we started from. And Acts was a good place to start from, and I thought I'd preach a series on the book of Acts and kind of lead up to the move into that new church building and that was about seven months away and so I started with Acts 1-1 one, one, and wherever I stopped on Sunday morning I picked up the next Sunday and went preached straight through the book of Acts it took me over three years to get through the book of Acts but I found some things in there that were that were exciting to me because this is really the best book of church management and church growth that's ever been written it's a book that has 28 chapters, but it's an incomplete book. We are living chapter 29. Because the apostle Luke started in the first chapter, and he said these things are written of the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. He never said anything about completing it. And so the responsibility that we have as a church is to fulfill what the Lord began to preach and teach. If we're going to do that, we have to know what they did in order to know what we ought to do. Now, I realize that, that centuries have passed, but you know, as I read through this book and I saw the different, 
the different cultures and the different cities and the different uh, societies and all the difference that were there, I realized that while we talk about all the, the, the great changes that have taken place, there have been basic core similarities in every generation. There have been heathens in every generation. There have been pagans in every generation. There have been cultures that have despised the gospel in every generation. There have been those who attacked the gospel in every generation. You can read it all through the book. And so as I, as I read through that and, and as I sought the Lord for what to talk about tonight and in the morning, it just seemed like the Lord was saying to me, just talk about let the church be the church. You know, we weren't called to compete with Hollywood for entertainment. We were not called to compete with the country club for amusement. We were not called to compete with social clubs for activities. We were called to a specific purpose. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's what we're called to do. Now the fact of the matter is the only way we can do that is through the anointing power of the Holy Spirit on what we do. None of us are smart enough, suave enough, sophisticated enough, educated enough, or influential enough to accomplish that without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so I looked at Acts chapter 3. The reason I, I like to start there is because the day of Pentecost is over. All of the excitement, the exhilaration, the thrill of that great day is concluded. And now those people who were the beginnings of the, of the church have to start in a regular routine of life doing the things that the Lord has told them to do. That's what you pick up in verse 1 of chapter 3. Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes upon him with John, Peter said, Look on us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The normal routines of life now were... Anything but normal, anything but routine. This chapter is actually the picture of the church that, as the Lord designed the church to be. They were changed people living filled with the Holy Spirit, going into a natural world with the charge to make a difference of eternal proportions. That was their responsibility. They've been challenged to translate the variances of this perverse generation into virtue and victory for the cause of Christ. That can only be accomplished after a person's been in the place where they have received the anointing, vision, inspiration, and transformation. Now we have to remember that in the Jewish tradition and culture, there, there were specific times of the day that they had specific activities. And in, the, and in the, the, the time of the day that they described here, they said Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. You have to remember, these were Jews. Now, they believed Jesus was the Messiah. There's no question about that. They were proclaiming that he was the Messiah. But you have to remember, as Dr. Charles Kahn pointed out in his book on Acts, that they had no thought of withdrawing from the fold of historic Judaism. They were just simply Jews who believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. And their task, as they understood it, was to convince their fellow Jews that this was fact and this was true. And so that's what they were doing. They were following the prayer traditions of, of the Jews. And so they're going, the Bible said, together at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. They were headed to the place to pray where all the Jews went to pray at that particular time. I think it's significant that the Bible said they went up 
together to the temple. Now, the reason that's significant is because these two guys had, had previously been just a little bit irritating to one another. In fact, the last time we saw them is over in John chapter 20, uh, 21, verses 20 to 22, where Peter, in frustration and perplexity, quiz, quizzes Jesus, what about him? What about that guy, you see? Peter was the practical person. John was the poet. Pre Peter was the doer. John was the dreamer. Peter had no patience for dreaming. He wanted to be doing something. And so there was, there was obvious tension that existed between these two. And you see it in John 21. But now something has happened. Something has changed. And the two of them, filled with the Holy Spirit now, are going together. And there is a, there's a power in their, in their uniting. G. Campbell Morgan said, Peter the doer and John the dreamer went into close fellowship. They found that they were not antagonistic but complementary to each other. And the fact of the matter is, here they were now coming to enjoy fellowship that they could share in kingdom life and kingdom work. Amos 3.3 3 said, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now the fact of the matter is, these two guys are going to prayer meeting at the right time, fulfilling the, res the responsibilities that they had as Jews. They, they found it necessary to continue to go and pray. And that's a little different than in some of our charismatic culture these days. Some people get all they need once or twice a year at some big event, and they don't need to pray anymore. They don't need to go to those regular times of prayer. In fact, if, if, you, if, you, really want to have a, if you really want to have a crowd, you announce a, a business meeting. But if, if you want very few folks to show up, call a prayer meeting, and there, there won't be many show up. Can I tell you the reason that this church continues to exist today and, and was impacted as it was in the early days is because there were people in the church who knew how to get a hold of God, and they wouldn't stop praying until they had touched heaven and prayed down the very presence and power uh, and glory of the Lord. They would pray and they'd pray until they prayed through. Now you don't hear that term much anymore. That just simply means you just keep praying until God breaks through and does something that nobody else can do. And, and that's what they did. They were, they were in need of, of a fresh touch from the Lord. They'd been there on the day of Pentecost. They were two of those originals, but they found it necessary to get regular and routine in their time of prayer. Now here's the thing.